Today on the Bandaroo Says Podcast, I will be sharing my favorite pieces of gear and my favorite movies from 2019, so go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 199 of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is what I says. Like always, in the show notes down below, there are timestamps of everything that I talk about, so you can skip around and save a few minutes. But if you got the time, I would appreciate you checking out the entire episode. If you do want a different version of the show, you can find that at bandrewsays.com. And if you want other amazing educational podcasts, geeksrising.com. Let's start with my favorite gear that I picked up in 2019, and I will explain a little bit why that is on my list. Number five is the Rode NTG3. This is on the list simply because it is a really nice sounding shotgun microphone. If you're looking for a darker, fuller low end from your shotgun microphone, I actually received multiple emails on one of the episodes I recorded with this mic saying it was the best that the micro- that the show has ever sounded. So I probably should be using that microphone still, but I am not. Alas, I am not. But based on the fact that I really enjoyed the sound of that microphone and it seems quite a few other people really liked the sound of that microphone, that is number five for my favorite gear of 2019. Number four is the CAD E100S. This is because it is a bright but insanely smooth microphone, but also because my expectations were so low. The reason being, I have tested out the CAD U1 and the CAD U37, and those are some terrible microphones based on my experience. I believe other people have had amazing experiences with them. Oh, it's so cheap. It sounds so good. Cool. I didn't have that experience. So I was expecting pretty much every CAD microphone to be somewhat subpar. The E100S completely blew my expectations out of the water, and it sounds incredible. It lets you get that full low end that is round and warm and beautiful. And then the top end, it maintains that detail and clarity without becoming piercing or sharp or unpleasant to listen to or even sibilant. It maintains that soft and smooth and rounded top end, which in my opinion is what makes a good presence or treble boosted mic. Number three is the Neat King B. This came in on the very last day of 2019. That is when my video came out. So it almost didn't make the cut for 2019, but this is a sleeper microphone. Holy smokes. If you don't know about Neat, it was a microphone company started by the same people who made blue mics, but they started the company under Gibson. Gibson makes guitars, and they had a bunch of subsidiary companies that made pro audio gear, Neat being one of those companies. While Neat was under Gibson, they released four microphones, I think it was, the Neat King B, the Neat Worker B, and then two or three or four or five or six USB microphones. But based on the USB microphone that I tested, it had a little bit of interference, although it did sound nice tonally, but I wasn't terribly impressed with it because of the issues there. But the Neat King B started at $350 or $400 while they were under Gibson, they bought themselves out from Gibson's ownership when Gibson was going through a bankruptcy, a restructuring, I believe, and they decreased the price from $350 to $99. And at $100, this has this is knocking some competition down because it sounds so good. It has that warm, round, soft, low end without being overly boomy or muddy. And the top end does have a bit of a boost to it but it is not piercing or painful to listen to. It just adds some nice clarity and detail to offset the proximity effect when you get right on top of the microphone. At $100, it blew my mind, and it is a highly recommended microphone by me now. 
Number two is the SE Electronics SE4400A. When I started this review, I said, oh, I wonder what microphone they could be ripping off, alluding to the AKG C414 because it has a very similar profile, a very similar design, as well as a very similar feature set. So it is very clear what they are doing here, what they are trying to bring to mind when a potential customer looks at that microphone. But when I listened to the sound that it recorded, this is one of the very rare wow moments for me. When I heard that, I, I just, I legitimately said, wow, that sounds incredible. It is a stellar, stellar microphone. I shouldn't use stellar anymore because that's now a model model name for some company that I don't fully support. But they do have, it does have this amazing sound quality to it. It is very even sounding all throughout the frequency response range. It is insanely versatile with all the, the cuts as well as I think there's nine polar patterns that you can switch between. Or maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe there's only four. I can't remember if there's in-between settings for any of the polar patterns. But it is insanely versatile. It sounds incredible. And I haven't reviewed the 414 XLS or XL2 yet. But I think the 4400A is going to give those microphones a run for their money because good golly gee willikers. That really was a wow microphone for me. And number one is the Motu M2. The reason this is on the list, it's not the most groundbreaking device. There are plenty of interfaces out there, and most of them will do everything you need them to do. The reason this is number one for me is because it seems Motu looked at what people were complaining about with audio interfaces and said, yeah, okay, we can do that. We can fix that. We can add that. And they did it. One of the only things that I have heard people asking for on the M2 line or the M line is inserts. Other than that, I think it does everything you could possibly need out of an interface. And it hits way above its weight class in terms of latency, noise performance, dynamic range, A to D converters. Everything is just top of the line. And I don't understand how it is at the price that it's at. Did that make sense? I don't understand how they are pricing it the way that they are because it is so high quality. Now, I should include a disclaimer. I don't know what the longevity of this device will be. I only had it a few weeks when I did the review. So it's possible that it will work well for six months and then just die. But if it does have any kind of life to it, I think that this is... It has deth dethroned the other most popular selling interfaces because it is, it does everything you need. And they added some very simple features that I am not clear why other audio interface manufacturers did not add, like usable meters, actual LED or LCD meters on there. So you can tell what level you're hitting. As Julian Krauss says, it would be nice to have some numbers on there, a scale, so you know exactly what you're hitting. But it gives you a much easier idea or a much better idea of what you're actually recording. And they added an on-off switch. What a novel idea. Just flip the switch. Okay, I don't want the interface on right now. I'm not recording. Off. What a novel, novel idea. So those are my top five favorite pieces of gear of 2019. I do have two honorable mentions. The Symbiosis Box of Doom. That really would be my number one if I had done a video on it because that box saved my channel. If it wasn't for buying that isolation cab and Sylvester, I think his name is, working with me to add a USB pass-through so I can test USB microphones in that, I would have quit the channel because I was so discouraged and beat up after getting some noise complaints. I was ready to call it, call it a day, but I am perfectly happy with how that turned out. And to my ears, it sounds incredible. I've had no noise complaints. I can still do my guitar tests and I am in love with that thing. 
And the second honorable mention for me is the Ernie Ball Music Man guitar that I bought. That's what I got for hitting 100,000 subscribers. It was a present to myself for four years of not quitting, of putting in the work and just grinding away every single week. And I love that guitar. I don't think I have touched a guitar or played a guitar that plays that well or feels that natural in my hand. I absolutely love everything about it. Maybe a little bit hotter output, maybe a little bit more control over the tone. But other than those two things, which are very minor, I am in love with that guitar. And that's going to be one that I play for the rest of my life. It just feels so right in the hand. There you go. Now that is all of my favorite gear of 2019. I am already compiling the list for 2020 because we have some heavy hitters coming up. What about my favorite movies of 2019? Quick clarification, these are movies that I saw in 2019, not movies that came out in 2019 because I did not see many of those. And we only have four on the list for this year. Number four is Elephant Man. This is one of the most depressing, dark, heartbreaking, and moving movies that I have ever seen. It legitimately brought me to tears, and not just a single tear. It was bordering on ugly crying. It was it was absolutely pathetic. If you saw a video of me watching this movie, you'd be like, I'm not watching this guy ever again. What a loser. The performances, the direction, the set design, everything in this movie is firing on all cylinders. There's nothing bad about it, and... That's why it's in my top movies of 2019 or my favorite films of 2019. If you have not seen it, set aside a weekend so you can watch it on Friday and then recover emotionally on Saturday and Sunday. Number three is Videodrome. This is a Cronenberg film and it is, it's as weird as a Cronenberg film you would expect one to be. It has very weird effects with televisions and VHS cassettes throbbing and all of that. But the reason that I love it is it is commenting on society's need for more and more extreme forms of entertainment where one day it may be okay to watch a Western movie. Then the next day you want to see a Western movie where people get killed. Then the next day you want to see the actual deaths. Then the next day you want to see the cowboy do certain things with certain people. It is just commenting on that constant escalation that we have. If you watch a movie from 2019, a horror movie, and then go watch a 1950s horror movie, it becomes abundantly clear what he is trying to say with this movie. It is going from a ghost looking like somebody with white face paint on to a ghost looking like somebody who had been decapitated and murdered in the most violent way, and they add all of these effects to make it as horrifying and startling as possible, and it could potentially (laughs) be a detriment to society as a whole with how extreme everything is getting, the accessibility of extreme pornography, all of that stuff. And Cronenberg did it in the 80s. It is... As relevant today, if not more, than it was in the 80s. And that is why that is one of my favorites of 2019. Next up, we have another really weird one. Number two is Eraserhead. This is the second David Lynch movie on this list this year. What a legend. Good job, David Lynch. You've done well. The reason I loved this movie is not everything was spelled out for you. It left a lot up for interpretation and... It was visually stunning, and it left you thinking. There are very few movies that allow you to do that anymore. One of the recent ones that did that for me was Mother with the exclamation point. It had Jennifer Lawrence, I believe. But this movie has that in spades. You will leave this movie thinking, what in the hell was that? And then the next day, you'll think... What if, he, what if he meant this with this one scene, this one shot? Is that what he was trying to say? 
And it gives you this sense of accomplishment, or at least it gives you a sense of, okay, I am not being talked down to. I am not being told what to believe. It is being left up to me to decide what is being said and how I can tie this film to my own life, to my own experiences. And I really do appreciate that David Lynch did that. And this movie, highly recommended if if you're into that. It was my second favorite that I saw in 2019. So now that I seem like I am some kind of pretentious film snob, my number one favorite movie of 2019 was Mayhem. If you know nothing about this movie, it is about a disease getting out in an office building and getting locked down by the CDC, and then everybody murdering the crap out of each other. It is violent. It is gory. It is hilarious. Samara Weaving, whenever she's in anything, I will watch it. She is a wonderful actress. She is beautiful to look at as well. And Stephen Young, he does an amazing job as well. And this is Joe Lynch. Joe Lynch did... He's uh, friends with Adam Green. That doesn't help at all. He, he does a podcast with him. But the reason that I loved this... This is... This is going to put me on some kind of list... But everybody who's worked in an office building and had a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day has had thoughts of, I'm going to put my fist through that effing wall right now if somebody comes in and asks me for anything else. Everybody who's worked in an office has had that subconscious thought. This movie is an outlet for that. It gives justification for the characters to act on those those thoughts and it's it's justifiable in these cases with the amount of i'm reluctant to call it nepotism but you see steven yun break you see samara weaving break and you understand why they have broken but then you throw in this virus or this disease or this chemical that removes people's inhibitions and leads them to doing whatever comes to mind. It makes for a very entertaining movie. And I actually watched this with a few people in a discord voice chat. And I believe both of them really enjoyed it as well. Eldest and keyboard. I think it was what an absolutely train ride roller coaster ride of a movie, an absolute blast and one of my all-time favorites now, Joe Lynch, you done excellent. Samara Weaving, Stephen Yun, incredible, incredible work. And that is it for my favorite stuff of 2019. I simply did not read enough books. If I can be honest, I didn't read any. <laughs> Whoops. I didn't listen to enough music either to come up with a substantial enough list to feel comfortable having any favorites. Nothing that I listened to or listen to as a book on tape was new or fresh to me so i didn't want to include it i did watch a few tv shows big bang theory i watched game of thrones none of those really stood out as amazing or worthy on being a top tv show of the year one that i did see on netflix at the very beginning of the year was titled maniac and that has jonah hill and I can't remember the actress's name, but it's about people who go into a governmental experiment or a lab test where you sign your life away for a week, you take drugs, and they notate what kind of effects it has on you. And that TV show was really, really good. I don't remember much about it because it's been about a year since I watched it. But if you're looking for a Netflix show that is pretty good and a fun watch... Although, albeit maybe a little bit depressing, Maniac on Netflix is a good option. But there, I didn't watch enough to come up with favorites. That is it for that whole segment of the show. Let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from Just Samson. He says, thanks, Bandrew. One, wish I would have known this before purchasing the boom mic from Amazon. Two, on top of that, I didn't get a bribe offer yet lol three wtf why are you not doing more videos like this four keep up the great work thanks wink 
just Samson or Wink, not sure which one your name is. Thank you very much for the comment, I appreciate. There are some really loud motorcycles outside. Let me answer these questions. Number three. Number one and two were not questions, they were statements, that's why I am skipping over them. Number three. WTF are you not doing more vids like this? This is in response to last week's episode of the show where I did this big expose. I exposed this company for shady practices. The reason I don't do more of that, I simply don't stumble across that many instances of something that is worthy of taking weeks of time to research and develop a story like that, find out where all the the nooks and crannies are and come up with something. I don't have that many encounters with information like that. If anybody runs into stuff like that, feel free to send me an email. I would love to, to get some leads and do some digging, but I don't have that much experience with that that side of content creation. And I don't know if I would have time or energy or the mental capacity to handle doing that every single week. I would love to do that a bit more where I call out companies for their shady behavior. I may or may not have another one that I am currently working on and looking into. We'll see how that goes. Maybe something that I share in the future, but it's just not something that I am aware of in most cases, which is why I don't do it. Number four was a statement. Wink, thank you very much for the comment. I appreciate. Next comment comes from Echo. They say, your argument kind of goes out the window when you say, I like to think when talking about YouTube reviewers. We need evidence. You are a diamond in the rough, someone who doesn't shill out for companies and makes a very scientific and consistent review for every mic you do telling us when it's been provided by the company as a review sample and stuff like that. That being said, you are not the majority. You are very much the minority of legitimately honest reviewers on YouTube. Remember the CSGO skin gambling drama not so long back? He didn't even disclose that he owned like half of the company, using his platform of millions of fans as customers to get them to gamble on his site. This is really effing scummy. At the end of the day, there are a metric F-ton of people out there with scummy morals that will do anything just to make a a little bit of money. That includes making shitty reviews where they only say positive things and even have an affiliate link with the company where they get a kickback for every sale. It's not uncommon. Echo, thank you very much for the comment and for pushing back a little bit on my stance. First off, I want to address something. You say that it is shady to include affiliate links in the show notes and description. Even when you give a bad review, I do that. I have Amazon affiliate links in pretty much every single one of my YouTube descriptions for the microphone I review, even if it is a bad microphone. Now, there are, I believe, one or two that I thought were so bad that if anybody disagreed me disagreed with me to the point that they were going to buy it, I wanted to cut that off right there and make it as difficult as possible. There were a few that I said I am not going to include any links to anything because nobody should be buying this. I can't remember what they are, but I am fairly certain there is one or two reviews like that. Secondly, I agree, me saying I like to think weakens my argument significantly. Let me explain why I think I said it that way. I am fairly spoiled when it comes to the market that I'm in or the niche that I am in because the audio reviewers that I have come across, for the most part, there are some that seem somewhat shady, but for the most part are extremely good about disclosing their relationships with companies as well as disclosing when something is sent to them or if they are, they bought it at a discount or anything. And when I say that, I am talking about people like Sound Speeds, In The Mix, Curtis Judd, Julian Krause, Booth Junkie, Epos Vox, Ray Ortega, Audio Hotline, Mike Russell, Metal 571, Wheezy Reviews, Obscure Mics, Produce Like a Pro, Creative Sound Lab, Steve Freeman, Music Gear Network and Anton Brown. All of I don't think Anton Brown or Steve Freeman have been sent anything, and I don't think that In the Mix 
does any reviews. But all of those people are, they seem to be very transparent from what I have watched. It doesn't seem as though any of those people are trying to push one over on their audience. Produce Like a Pro always says, this was sent to me by Company X, and we're going to be giving it away at the end of the show. But he does it in his wonderful British accent. And maybe that's why I don't think that YouTube reviewers are as shady as some other people have encountered. Because in the audio niche, it seems pretty transparent. Nobody seems to be too shady. As I mentioned, there are some. I know there was some criticism of Glenn Fricker. I don't know if that criticism was justified or not, but he got some criticism for being paid for certain reviews and ripping apart the competitors to the people who were paying him for those videos. Not 100% sure of the validity, so I am not stating that as a fact. I just know there was a video strongly criticizing him for that, but the video has been taken down now, so I'm not 100% sure what happened there. And then there was Chappers. Ron Chapman, I think his name is. He was getting criticized for certain advertisements he was running saying it's wrong to give an advertisement and give a scholarship to a school because then people have to pay some money. I, I don't know. The, the entire thing that I am saying is the audio niche seems to be great in that department for the most part. A few outliers if the criticisms are correct. I appreciate you pushing back and pointing that out. I agree. I should include examples of what I am referring to when I, when I make statements like that, rather than saying, I like to think that I, I caught that when I was editing the video and I decided I'm not going to go back and re-record anything. I'm in my sweatpants, which I'm actually wearing today. I'm wearing sweatpants while I record like a bum. But thank you very much, Echo. I appreciate it. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Alrighty, if you have any questions or want to be featured on this show, head over to askbandrew.com and there are instructions on how to submit an audio, a video, or just a plain old email question. And I will most likely answer it on an upcoming episode of the show. First email comes from everybody's favorite submitter, everybody's favorite person, Tim the Mic Fail Finder. Tim, he says, Hi, Bandrew. I know the holidays are over, but I just couldn't resist sharing this singing Santa toy mic fail. Cheers, Tim. Tim, I always knew that Saint Nick was a little b****. I always knew it. That old, fat, white man is such an incompetent waste of space. The image that Tim has sent me has Santa Claus standing at a microphone. It is very similar to the Shure Super 55. And if you are familiar with that microphone, it is a side address microphone. Dumb <laughs> is singing into the top of it. You absolute, complete, and utter moron. Santa, what are you doing? If you'll allow me to venture a guess what happened here. If that microphone stand were spun around, Santa Claus would be singing into the correct side of the microphone. I am guessing whatever child labor was used to make this toy. <laughs> Poor kids. Can we free them, please? Whatever child labor was used to make this toy, they didn't understand how a microphone works or this microphone in particular. So they sewed that microphone stand in however the heck they wanted. But if that microphone stand were spun around 180 degrees, Santa would not be a stupid, fat, worthless old idiot who doesn't know how to speak into a sure Super 55. But being that child labor was likely used and exploited to make this this cheap, nichey toy. Nichey? Is that an insult? Nichey toy? I don't know. Maybe Santa wouldn't be stupid. That's what I'm trying to say. Tim, thank you very much for the email. I appreciate it. Hiya, but next email comes from Greg. 
He says, Hiya, Bandrew. Been listening for a few weeks, loving your podcast. I want to start rapping and maybe do other spoken word things, podcast, etc. What mic and preamp stuff would you recommend for around $150 to $200? I would prefer a mixer to future-proof my, my setup. Thanks, and I appreciate it. Greg, that is an excellent question. As far as mixers under that price point, because you want a mixer and a microphone, you'll probably need a pop filter, a stand, a cable as well, all for under $150 to $200. Your options are very limited. I think as far as the mixers go, you're going to be stuck with something like the Behringer Q302 USB or Q502 USB. Those mixers do not offer a full 48 volts of phantom power, meaning you cannot or you likely would not be getting the best performance out of full condenser microphones. So that eliminates those from the market from your microphone selection. So you would be going with a dynamic microphone, a dynamic microphone. And with the budget you have, again, you are very limited. Behringer has some pretty darn decent, affordable Options, the XM8500, the BA85A, all nice options. Then you have the SM48, which is another option. You could go and spend a lot of money, 100 bucks on your microphone. The SE Electronics V7 is amazing. The SM58, the E835 from Sennheiser, all really nice options, different tones. So you have to be the judge there. But with that budget... And the statement that you want a mixer, that's what I got for you. Q302 or Q502, which are USB mixers, you're going to need a dynamic. So the V7, XM8500, SM48, BA85A, E835, any number of $100 dynamic mics. Then that leaves a little bit of budget for a microphone stand and a pop filter and you should be off to the races. Hope that helps, Greg. Best of luck to you. Let me know what you land on in the email or in a comment or anything like that. And lastly, we have a voice submission from Orange Juice. Orange Juice. Take it away, Orangey boar. Hey, Banjo, I have a question. I've been a fan for a while now, and I just want to know if the... Yamaha MG10XU will work very well or nicely with Shure SM48. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that question. And to answer your question, I recorded a very quick sample and I did boost the audio plus six decibels in post to bring it to a somewhat more listenable level. Take that information and use it however you want. But here is that sample that I recorded. Here you go, orangey boy. I hope this helps you. I am speaking into the Shure SM48 right on top of the microphone, running into the Yamaha MG10XU. No pad, no high pass filter, no 48 volts phantom power. The gain is set at around four o'clock on the gain dial. It is set to a unity on the fader, which is the last dial per the channel. There is no EQ being done to it, no high pass, no mid cut or boost, and no low cut or low boost. And here is how it sounds, so you tell me. Does it sound good? You be the judge, because I don't know. I actually do know. It seems to be working just fine. That's my answer. Okay. Back to the later recorded thing that I am answering now. Bye-bye. All right, Orangey, there you have it. I hope that helps you determine if the SM48 and the MG10XU is right for you. Best of luck to you, and there you go. I think that is actually going to wrap up for this week. One personal thing. I was just on the podcast engineering school episode 134, 133, I can't remember the number, but this last week, you can find a post about it on bandrewscott.com, or you can just go to podcastengineeringschool.com and check out his show there. And that is all the personal information or personal news that I have. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. 
If you want more educational shows, geeksrising.com. The outro for this week's episode, sorry, Alan, people are sending them in and we are using them. (laughs) I didn't mean to rip off your idea. Um, The outro for this week's episode was recorded by John, a.k.a. No Names Please. So, John, thank you very much for sending this in. You sound great, and I love the improvisation. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Bandrew Says Podcast, a Geeks Rising production. Geeks Rising is a podcast network that exists to help you become a better creator and explore your passions. To learn more, head on over to geeksrising.com.